Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. One of our guests, the Dean, Dean Mao, came in here and asked how long we'd been <laughs> co-hosting together. This is a sad story. And and it's fun. You laugh because it's always good to laugh. Yeah. Otherwise, you cry. And um, the reason you're laughing is because we have a long history of doing other shows. You're filling in for Carol now, but we have right. a long history of doing other shows. Other shows that have been canceled. We used to have a daily streaming show, uh, Quick Take Stock. Yeah. Rest in peace. Then we had a crypto show together. We had a crypto show. A weekly crypto show. Uh, what a what a blaze of glory. Uh, Crypto IRL? Yeah. 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 It was have, a great show. It was a great show. Uh, what a weird time, though, to have a crypto show. We had it, of course, uh, one of the events that happened was FTX collapsed. Uh, so that was interesting to cover in real time. It was the crypto winter. Yeah. Well, it was the start of it. The start of it, yeah. For a while, it was the crypto summer. It was like crypto on the sun. Well, that's kind of a perfect segue to get to our next guest. Adam Sullivan is the CEO of Core Scientific. The ticker is CORZ. And the reason why I say that's the perfect segue is because this is a company that's intimately familiar with the ups and downs of the industry. Um, at once, it, for once, it was the at one point it was the largest public Bitcoin mining company by computing power, but it went bankrupt back in December of 2022. It's now emerged from bankruptcy. It's back listed publicly again, but the company's going for something a little different right now. Adam, welcome to Bloomberg Business Week. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you for having me on. You still are doing Bitcoin mining, but you're looking more at the computing power to do other stuff right now. You're absolutely right. So we're a digital infrastructure company at heart. We've developed 800 megawatts of infrastructure that allowed us to be the largest Bitcoin mining company for the past three years. And now we're utilizing that infrastructure to be one of the largest data center companies in North America. Um, Talk to us about the bankruptcy process and sort of what you were able to do with the fresh start. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, tumultuous process, right? You know, I came into the company about four months into the bankruptcy process, and there was a big fight over the valuation of the company because Bitcoin is volatile, Bitcoin mining returns are volatile. So the valuation of the company that you have to set four months before you come out of the bankruptcy process uh, is challenging. And so we came out with a very unique capital structure uh, that we've now solved for. Uh, We solved for it last August or this uh, previous month. And we've been able to clean up all of the litigation, all of our balance sheet, and put ourselves in a really strong position to execute on the H or the high performance computing play that we have in front of us now. Can we talk a little bit more about uh, Bitcoin mining and data centers? Because not to quote Harry Styles again, but it is a real sign of the times here. Uh, And it's interesting. It sort of feels like how Facebook became meta, but now they're really in an AI company and Mm -hmm. meta is sort of an afterthought. I mean, how do you identify as a business. Are you a Bitcoin miner? Is that how you introduce yourself? Or do you introduce yourself first with the data centers? We're a digital infrastructure company. And so okay. what we develop is very application specific data centers. We've been developing them for Bitcoin mining uh, facilities for the past seven years. And now we're developing them now for specifically for uh, high performance computing for artificial intelligence. Why make that change? Well, artificial intelligence and high performance computing provides us with long, steady contracts with large counterparties. So we just signed uh, 12-year contracts that total more than $6.7 billion in revenue over the next 12 years. So it really takes away the volatility and provides us the opportunity to make counter-cyclical investments into Bitcoin mining. How much of your revenue now comes from Bitcoin mining? Uh, nearly all of it does today. And so, Even though you signed these contra- this contract Yeah, already. these contracts are for delivery in 2025 and 2026. So what's the ultimate goal in terms of portion of revenue from Bitcoin mining versus high performance computing? Yeah, so we're, if you can if you can have that distinction. Yeah, well, we'll be developing these sites over the course of 2025 and 2026. So as we look forward to 2025, it's going to be, um, you know, a lot of high performance computing revenue. But as we look at 2026, 2027, it's going to be much more heavily weighted towards uh, the d- traditional data center revenue. I want to talk a little bit more about the mining piece uh, in particular. Remind me when the last halving was. It was in April of this year. It was in April of this year. That feels like a year ago. Uh, So it was in April of this year. I mean, how do you handle the halving as a miner? Of course, for those listening who aren't super acquainted with the language, of course, the halving is basically when uh, you have to solve a lot of 
you know, puzzles and computer problems. And then you get Bitcoin as a reward as a miner. And then that reward is cut in half mm -hmm. every four years. I mean, how does that actually impact your business? We talk about it all the times in terms of the price impact, but from a revenue standpoint, how do you handle that? Yeah. So the expectation is that when block reward gets cut in half, difficulty drops or how hard it is to find a block. In this previous halving, difficulty did not really fall off. And so mining revenue did get cut almost nearly in half in April in mm. a single day. And so what we saw over Q2 was much more challenged mining economics. And we handle it a little bit differently than other companies because we developed our own software stack. We're able to have much more flexible energy contracts with our end providers. And so that provided us an opportunity to actually have our costs only increase 60% post having, whereas what you saw in the broader market, generally speaking, about 100% increase in, in cost to mine. That's really interesting. And I mean, Bitcoin, it's the actual price itself has been interesting and in that it's been really boring. I feel like we've been hovering around sixty thousand uh, dollars since basically the end of February. What's the current it's like the ETF after the yeah. ETF? Yeah, right? we got the ETFs and then yeah. we go up, we go down. But really, we're in the in neighborhood of sixty thousand dollars. What is the current break even level when it comes to Bitcoin price? Yeah, so for, for us, yeah. um, we announced in Q2 our break-even Bitcoin price was about $29,000. So you're having a great time. Yeah, so we're still... As long as the price is above 29000 right? Well, the, the expectation is if Bitcoin price fell, we, you'd see difficulty come off the network or network hash rate drop. And so you expect the break-even price to then drop uh, in tandem with that. I'm, I'm wondering about the infrastructure that you own mm -hmm. and how easy it is to switch that from Bitcoin mining to high performance computing. Is it impossible? No, but it's not easy. It takes a very talented team. So much of our team comes from the traditional data center industry. And so the way our facilities were originally constructed was with the idea in mind that we're going to be a tr we're going to be able to convert some of these facilities to traditional data centers in the future. So our facilities look much more like powered shells huh. with the opportunity to convert it based on the end specifications of the user. You mentioned flexibility when it comes to power costs. This is a, a huge determinant in how profitable a Bitcoin miner is. Because the main it yeah. is the main yeah. determinant. Yep. Um, what do you do for power? We're entirely on grid, but we participate in multiple different load programs that provide, you know, they, it gives us downtime of about one, two, three percent, depending on the uh, depending on the time of year. But it's a significant reduction in power costs. Mm. What are the politics there? Because I remember with a lot of the uh, Bitcoin miners, something that we explored in crypto IRL, rest in peace, was, of course, that uh, the miners came under a lot of fire for the electricity usage. It mm -hmm. feels like data centers haven't quite experienced that same criticism, probably because I feel like as a society, we're all interested and excited about the possibilities of AI. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think both data centers and Bitcoin miners have been under fire. Data centers were under fire prior to the Bitcoin miners being under fire. Um, but I think where we sit today is a lot more states and a lot more regulatory bodies are starting to understand the benefits of Bitcoin mining. And so it's actually provided a big opening for utilities because utilities have to count data center demand against peak demand. but. Bitcoin miners do not count against that peak demand. We only have 30 seconds left, but make the case for the benefits. People might be listening and say, wait a second, the benefits of Bitcoin mining. Like, mm. I don't I don't care about it. I don't see any benefits. What are the benefits? The benefits allow new generation to come online, even if it's not economic to run 100% of the time. Bitcoin miners can take that base load so that in the 5 to 10% or 20% of when that power is actually needed, that can be supplied back to the grid, while the Bitcoin miners are paying for the power the rest of the time. Adam, good to see you. Good to see you as Thanks well. for joining us on Bloomberg Business Week. Adam Sullivan is CEO of Core Scientific. C-O-R-Z is the ticker. He's here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. Well, our next guest spent more than 30 years at AT&T. She ultimately rose to become the CEO of AT&T Business. She was the first woman and first woman of color CEO in the company's history. Now she's on the boards of 3M. CSX and Franklin Covey. She's a senior fellow and adjunct professor at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Oh, and she's got a brand new book out. It's called Lead Bigger, The Transformative Power of Inclusion. Pleased to have with us Ann Chow here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Ann, how are you? Welcome. Thank you so much, Tim. It's great to be here with you. Hey, we got a great big chunk of time, so we're going to get to the book in a few minutes, but okay. we'd be remiss after more than 30 years uh, in the telecom business if we didn't talk a little bit about what's going on out there, because 
it's kind of wild with uh, the news that you have Verizon last week announcing a deal for Frontier, sort of getting more into the broadband space. This deal was a little surprising to me because I thought wireless was really the future that these companies are going for. Fiber is so expensive to install, to maintain, to get a tech out there to help you hook it up to your home. What's going on out there? Yeah, so Tim, um, as you know, I've been out of the industry for a couple of years. Right? Yeah, so, a couple of years, but yeah, I'm, years, I'm sure you, you still follow it <laughs> yeah, a little bit, right? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But what I would say is that um, you know, convergence is really where it's at. You know, as, as you think about the wireless network and wireless capabilities, yeah. yes, I mean, that's, that's, that's critical to the functioning of society. But ultimately, it all comes down to a fiber network, it comes down to a wired network as part of that infrastructure. So that's, uh, you know, that's what I think, um, you know, we're seeing out there is that coming together. And, you know, I'd love an opportunity to talk about just leadership in general and, you know, inclusion. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. we got a lot of time. We're going to, we're yeah, going to get okay. to that. But, right. I, but, I'm, right. I, but I just thought, I thought that with, um, with how expensive fiber is mm -hmm. and with the advancements that we've made in wireless, moving forward, we'd see more wireless nodes than, you know, people digging fiber. Are you saying that we're still going to be having fiber coming into homes and businesses and not going to be going wireless? No, what I'm, say what I'm saying is, is that the way that networks will continue to evolve, as yeah. they always have, will be based on the latest technologies, right, and the demands of the marketplace, right? Certainly with the needs for storage and the high capacity computing and the emergence yeah. of AI, there will always be a need for networks and high capacity, high powered, you know, fast networks. And so all I'm saying is that as the technology evolves, that's where it will be, right? And ultimately, if you look at any network, right, a mobile network, it includes stuff in the ground, yeah. right? It includes wired capabilities. That's all I'm saying. And I'm sure you could have plenty of other experts who could talk about costs in a much more specific way than I could. Well, I am curious to talk a little bit more about AI. Yeah. AI is in every conversation. We talk about it all the time, how it relates to different industries, of course. Uh, mostly, you know, we talk about it in terms of the, the chip makers and sort of the picks and shovels right now, maybe a little bit uh, with the iPhone, given uh, what we heard yesterday. How do you think it'll affect AT&T and the industry, of course, that they sit in? Yeah, so Katie, I wouldn't say that I'm the expert in right, AI. Right, right. Just broad say, brush you know? strokes. Yeah, so I mean, I can talk about what I think about yeah. AI and how it will impact the need to be even more inclusive, if you will, right? And so what AI does, um, it helps us and gives us as, you know, as humans, as leaders, the opportunity to actually advance our human skills, right? Which means that because AI will help us with more basic computing tasks, help elevate our intelligence, no pun intended, pun mm -hmm. intended, um, we as leaders have now got to figure out what are the kinds of skill sets we need to develop in our people, what kind of talent we need to complement and utilize those tools that are now just simply emerging across every industry and every business in a way. So the actual calling for bigger leadership um, is more important now today than it has ever been. Mm. Do you think about, I'm, I'm just thinking about like, how many things around our home we mm -hmm. plug in yep. and charge yep. and are connected to the network. Um, is, old, is that, do we see, you talk about convergence, do we see more and more individual items connected to the network? The Apple Watch, for example. I mean, I'm wearing a Garmin. You're wearing a Garmin, but I'm pointing at you because you do have a somewhat of a smartwatch, but that's not, that's not connected to the network. That's like connected to your phone, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can get the Apple Watch connected to the network. You're, you know, you're paying more for, for each, each additional mm -hmm. advice, device that you add on. Or are we going to see a convergence within, within hardware? Mm -hmm. And we're going to see fewer devices, but doing more. Yeah, again, I'm not a hardware expert, but what I do believe will happen is, right, there is more, and this is really what AI and, yeah. uh, you know, computing is all about. It's about the data. It's about the intelligence, right? So as we see a more need for data, whether that's in how healthcare evolves, right, the, the watch, fitness, and health, health monitoring, or in other aspects of, you know, monitoring your water levels or your, your utilities, these are all things where if more data is more helpful to us as a society, that innovation will occur, right? There will be more connected things and that will help generate, you know, more need for data, more need for computing and more need for connectivity. Okay, so how, how do you make sense of all this data that is out there? How uh, do I make sense of it? Yeah, I mean, how does a company make sense of all this data? How does a leader make sense of all this data? Because if you think about everything that's monitored today, yeah, yeah. you have so many inputs. I mean, you could probably, as the CEO of a company, have an understanding of when people are badging in, when people are badging mm -hmm. out, when they're more engaged, when they're not engaged. A lot of this has to do with how you create a workforce that is aligned with what you want to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely right. 
Right, and so the first, the first part of bigger leadership, of inclusive leadership, um, and let me first say what, in, what is inclusive leadership, it is simply, and leading bigger is simply about widening your perspective to have greater performance and impact. That's all that is, right? But the part of that widening of your perspective is being able to handle and process, even yourself as a human, more data sources, right? Surround yourself with more different people, surround yourself with more different data sources, different, different media, and otherwise. And that will be absolutely key as it relates to how to lead forward um, and you know, get ahead of uh, you know, where you need to go. Um, speaking of getting where you need to go, yeah. I'm always so interested in people who spend almost their entire careers at a yeah. single company, especially, mm -hmm. I brought this up yesterday. We did, yeah, we were speaking of, of course, the former CEO of Dow. Yeah, and he spent more, he spent 32 years just like you did at uh -huh. Dow. Um, but it's so hard to find somebody early on in their career, mm -hmm. except for Katie, who spent their entire <laughs> career at a single company. Is that right, Bloomberg, Katie? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Katie was born here. Born in this building, I don't actually leave. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I live here. But you got a long way to go before 32 years. Yeah, a long well, way. I've got eight in the bag, so I'm, I'm on my way. Okay, great. But do you think that, um, and you teach, you teach school, you yeah. teach business school students, so do you see that still as a typical career path for somebody, or do you see them jumping around more? Yeah. Yeah, so I do actually get this question quite, quite frequently, right? Do we see the younger workforce, the emerging workforce, yeah. having this idea that they're going to be in a place for 30 plus years, right? And the answer is absolutely not, right? Mm. I mean, I think that the pace of change today is nothing like we've ever seen it. I think that there is a desire and a transparency for what opportunity is out there in today's workforce. I happen to have two Gen Z daughters. Oh, no So kidding. I spent, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. And I uh, spent plenty of time with Gen Zers, right? And what I'm so excited about, so hopeful about, is the fact that they are even more courageous and bold about what they want and what they don't want, right? I know plenty of Gen Zers who will only work in a work environment that's hybrid, as yeah. an example, right? And that is a requirement. They'd rather not have a job than be hybrid, right? And so um, that is something that as a old Gen Xer, I would have never, I would have never embraced, right? I would have said, hey, my job is like my foremost thing. My job is necessary to have the life I want to live as opposed to knowing what I wanted in my life and then having my job fit that. So I don't think it's a paradigm, Tim or Katie, that, mm -hmm. that, that long-term loyalty. But what I think that puts, the pressure that puts on bigger leaders is we have, to, we have to lead differently. We have to evolve with the times, right? You can't count on institutional knowledge that is indigenous over the decades. Um, and in fact, when you think about long-term planning from a strategic standpoint, you know, can we really predict what's going to happen in five years, yeah. let alone five, right? So uh, fundamentally, the pace of everything has accelerated. I'm so glad you brought up the, the hybrid point because I do think that, I mean, you think about the, the effects of the pandemic, maybe some of the, the lasting changes is that hybrid structure. Uh, I mean, in my own life, I think about the time, I, I still spend a lot of time at the office, but I used to be here, you know, eight to 6 p.m. every single day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't do that anymore. Yeah, but you're still getting those hours in. Oh yeah, no, but I go home and I work. I have to be here every day because you know I'm on air. But right. um, and then I, a lot in my personal life, my friends. I have a lot of friends who move jobs for that uh, hybrid flexibility. They're all millennials. But when I mean, you think about leaders today, I always wonder: Is it sustainable? I mean, do you think that those Gen Zers will fall in line, or do you think that you know leadership at big companies today will have? the desire to be flexible and meet them where they are. Yeah, well, you know, the, the very last chapter of my book is actually called flexibility, mm, right? There you so go. So I fundamentally believe that flexibility is here to stay, right? I, I personally cannot stand the moniker of return to the office or back to the office. Has anybody ever actually found a way to go back to the past? No. <laughs> right. A doc in Back to the Future. That's right. I yeah. actually was there with the DeLorean and everything, yeah, right? You can but, do it. You, know, that's you think not 88 miles an hour with the flux capacitor, <laughs> you can pull yeah, it the off. The flux capacitor can yeah. do anything. Gigawatts, however many gigawatts <laughs> yeah, exactly. you could possibly have. So, but on that note, right, what leaders have to do now, and nobody has been taught this, right? How to lead in this way. Nobody's been taught how to deal with a workforce that is geographically dispersed, you know, a combination of different modalities which could change every single day who is in a work site versus who is not. So um, in my view, flexibility is here to stay. It's here to stay because we want, as leaders, access to the best talent possible. We want access to as diverse a customer base as possible. We want access to the most diverse, compelling investor base, right? And as 
you know, as every generation emerges, every generation becomes more and more diverse in terms of what their needs are, you know, the clarity of their, of their purpose. And it's incumbent upon us as leaders to figure out how to operate this way. But what I will say is that um, you have to now treat the office or presence mm -hmm. with great intention. You mm -hmm. cannot just assume that because people are present physically in the office, that they're more productive, that they're happier, that that's they're more point. engaged. And I think that's one of the fundamental differences because Katie, when it was eight to six, we were, right? Yeah. We were, when it was pre-COVID, we were all in the office. Engagement was a fact because that's the only way we knew how to work. Sit tight because we're going to do some news and then we're going to come back more with Ann Chow. Uh, she's the author of the new book, The Lead Bigger, The Transformative Power of Inclusion. She spent more than 30 years at AT&T. She's on three boards of publicly traded companies. That's next on Bloomberg Business Week. I want to get right back to Ann Chow. She's former CEO at AT&T Business. She spent more than 30 years at the company. She ultimately rose to become the CEO. She was the first woman and first woman of color CEO in the company's history. She's on three boards of she's on boards of three publicly traded companies, and she's a senior fellow and adjunct professor at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. She's got a brand new book out. It's called Lead Bigger: The Transformative Power of Inclusion. So let's talk a little bit about that, mm -hmm. because four years ago, we'd be sitting here having a completely different conversation about inclusion, DEI, the way people identify themselves and the way people bring themselves to work. Right. But just in the last few months, we've seen this huge shift. We got Ford coming out recently and saying, along with other companies, including Harley Davidson, Lowe's, Tractor Supply, Deere, Brown Foreman. Um, essentially pulling back from pledges to commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Many of them were made in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Um, and many of these companies have been targeted online to sort of roll back these DEI initiatives. How do you view that as a leader? Mm -hmm. So as a, as a leader, you know, I, I will tell you, Tim, that, and I appreciate the question, um, that I think DEI has largely been misunderstood. Huh. I personally don't like the acronym because it, um, you know, in, in some circles, it means one thing when it's actually three different things. It's diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, my view of that is that diversity is just simply a reality of the modern world, right? Every generation that comes forward becomes more and more diverse. There are many different dimensions to diversity. Uh, you know, equity is just about fairness, and inclusion is the topic as to what I wrote the book, right? Inclusion means widening your perspective by including everyone that, uh, you know, that is in your ecosystem, everyone, to have better performance and better impact. So where I think DEI um, is misunderstood um, is that it has, in some circles, been now interpreted as issues of representation based mm. on gender and race alone at the cost of everything else, which is not at all what each of those words is, nor what inclusive leadership is about. Um, you know, and I'm sure that those companies, you know, um, had reasons for making the decisions they did. Um, I'm often asked advice on this topic from leaders across different businesses, and this is the advice that I give them, which is you have to start with understanding what the purpose of your business is, as well as what your value system is. You also have to be very, very clear about how performance is measured and mm. who your stakeholders are. Um, not all stakeholders at any time are, you know, are created equal. And one of your jobs as a leader is to mitigate and manage risk, right? And so, um, no doubt, there are reasons for why those companies uh, made those decisions. And I think that each of us as leaders has just got to be prepared for, as we serve a set of stakeholders, that we intentionally make sure that we message and care for the other stakeholders who may be impacted in those decisions. And it's a pretty nuanced it debate is. and pretty nuanced communications coming from different companies. So I want to clarify what, what Ford did recently. Um, Jim Farley wrote in a note to employees that the external and legal environment related to political and social issues continues to evolve and the company no longer will speak publicly on polarizing issues right. of the day. Mm -hmm. Well, to that point, I mean, this conversation that we're currently having in society around DEI and this pullback that we're seeing from certain companies, it kind of reminds me about ESG, for mm -hmm. example. I mean, there was mm -hmm. a whole kerfuffle yeah. uh, over ESG a couple of years ago. And you think about these three letter acronyms, uh, you could look at these different conversations and say it's inevitable that these sort of conversations become politicized and it's hard for the C-suite to navigate around that. Do you think it's inevitable, this politicization? Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily, right? In, in my view, leadership is a choice that we all make. 
Uh, leadership has no gender, it has no age, it has no color, it has no politics, it has no religion, right? And leadership is all about rallying and aligning up a group of people to go get something done, to do work. That's what it has always been. Um, you know, I, you know I've, I've, I've never been a, uh, you know, sort of political kind of person. Um, I do think that acronyms are problematic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly I come from an industry where acronyms are all over the place. <laughs> um, and while, you know, I think we as humans also have this need to simplify, oversimplify things, right? And so, um, you know, uh, inclusion is so much more than just representation. It's about an environment that you create to widen your perspective, to look at new data sources, to you know, surround yourself with different people, to advance your business, to in innovate, to grow, right? to build a contemporary workforce that will compete not just today, but tomorrow. It's all of those things that make c really just good business sense. Right? And are gender and race um, included in that scope? Yes, but it's not just that. Do you think companies should speak out on issues that are not related to their businesses? Um, I do not. I do not. I feel very strongly that companies and, and leaders need to stay focused on their purpose, on their values, and on their stakeholders, right, and how performance is being measured. And, you know, that doesn't mean that there aren't issues. If there are issues out there that are, that are causing you or they, that they directly go against your purpose and your values, then you are, in fact, compelled to, right, because you're staying focused on that business purpose. I don't necessarily feel that leaders should feel compelled um, to wade into every water, you know, every step of waters. It's a very, it's a very personal decision, I think, to do so. You know, each one of us are faced with that, right? Even though on social media profiles, it's always views are my own. When you're the, a leader of an organization, a team, a big company, your views are not just your own. So how do you balance that with some of the contentious issues that are important to voters, for example? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, um, different regulations around a woman's right to choose in different mm -hmm. states. Like, how do you how do you figure that out in a, in a presidential election? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what what I know I will be listening for tonight, you know, is uh, I will be listening for bigger leadership. I will be listening for leadership that, you know, focuses on individual rights, but also focuses on what is right for our country um, as it relates to policies and programs. And like I said, leadership has no politics, right? Leadership just is. Um, I will also say that leadership is about leading all the people, not just the people who may agree with you. And I think that's what inclusive leadership is all about. So that's what I'm going to be listening for tonight. And Chow, former CEO of AT&T Business, She's also the author of the new book, Lead Bigger, The Transformative Power of Inclusion. She joins us here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio and Television. It is Bloomberg Business Week. That is Katie Greifeld in for Carol Messer. I'm Tim Stenebeck. Katie, what are you doing tonight at 8 o'clock? Uh, I told you already, I'm taking magnesium, I'm taking my melatonin. Uh, I will, you know, watch a little bit of our coverage. Of course, the debate doesn't start until 9 p.m., but we're going to have some great coverage on Bloomberg TV and radio. Kaylee Lines, Joe Matthew, David Gura, what an all-star lineup. That was perfect. Thanks. <laughs> It was a very enthusiastic promo. Yeah, and it was the best part was that I'm being sincere. I am excited. I'm going to be watching it on the uh, Bloomberg Business apps. As you should. Hey, um, speaking of politics, Kamala Harris proposing a tenfold increase in the small business tax deduction for startup costs. It's a new weapon in her arsenal as she vies with Donald Trump to show voters who can best assuage their anxieties about the economy. Trump, for his part, has touted lowering the corporate tax rate to 15%, but what is a small business owner to do? What are they thinking? To get an understanding of how they're thinking about the election, we bring in Elizabeth Gore. She's president and CEO of the fintech platform Hello Alice. It's a fintech platform for small business owners. Elizabeth joins us from San Francisco. Elizabeth, help us understand the visibility that you have at Hello Alice into how small business owners are thinking about politics. Well, howdy, y'all. I'll probably take melatonin, too, so I'm with you. I get it. <laughs> uh, look, at Hello Wells, we serve 1.5 million small business owners with credit, loans, and different access to capital, and we talk to them all the time about what they're thinking, what they're worried about, and look, 70% of them are, have not decided who they're voting for, and it's based off what they're going to hear about policies around taxes, inflation, immigration. However, 95% of them have said they are going to vote. And that is indicative of previous elections. Small business owners have a high propensity of voting. So this is a population that both candidates need to pay attention to. 
And it's interesting, I mean, uh, that, you know, a significant portion have not yet decided who they're going to vote for, but they're definitely going to vote. I mean, that sort of uh, raises the stakes on tonight's debate. What will small business owners be looking for in terms of topics that they want to hear about from Kamala Harris and Donald Trump? Look, there are 33 million small businesses in this country. We have five times the amount opening than the history of our country. This is a really critical population. Never one thing they want to know is taxes, 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 taxes. And remember, it's not just federal. We're looking at state elections, local elections as well. The next is inflation. Cost of goods matters to these companies. Finally, we think about immigration in other terms, but hiring is a massive still ordeal post-COVID to small business owners. So how they feel immigration impacts that is going to be critical. Interesting. Do you have um, have you done any research on how these small business owners feel after a change at the top of the ticket? You know, it's interesting. Um, the undecided was uh, much higher and now it's gone lower. So, okay. you know, uh, we don't know which way that that is pushing, but it definitely That's was so a change. So, to, well, so yes. OK, so before Biden dropped out, undecideds were about 25 percent. Right. And now what wild? are Yeah. What are undecideds now? So we're at 30 percent. Interesting. So okay. things have changed. And look, here's what's really important about that is they are really listening tonight of what are those policies. And you said corporate earlier. There is a big delineation between yeah. corporate and small business. Yeah. So that's what they're really listening to those key words. The vast majority of jobs in this country are coming from businesses with less than 30 employees. So that's what I'm paying attention to and what our customers are paying attention to. Yeah, it's a really nice reminder that, I mean, small businesses are the lifeblood of this economy. And I want to go back to uh, the point you made about immigration, of course, that a lot of small mm -hmm, business owners mm -hmm. will be focused on immigration. And of course, we are fresh off uh, the last month's jobs report, the August jobs report. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of questions about the labor market. What view mm -hmm. do you have into how small business owners are feeling about labor availability right now? Yeah, well, on one, hi one hand, it's exciting because over 70% of them are hiring right now so i you know that gets me excited that there is growth in the market on the flip side they are not finding the labor they need we're still in these quote hiring wars in their own neighborhoods and i'm talking about the folks that serve y'all every day your coffee shops your dry cleaners your auto mechanics they've got to have labor in order to do their jobs for you so this is a major topic you are president and ceo of a business have that you have you decided who you're going to vote for um i have i have um but i am always listening and pushing till the day of to make sure that both campaigns are going to understand the policies that they need to set forward do you feel like they're understanding the policies that affect I these think small they're business listening. owners I, there, there's a there's a difference between understanding and listening right there's been massive shifts at the sba there's been lawsuits and litigation around supply diversity and supply chain. And so we have a lot to do. Capital is very expensive right now for small business owners. It is not accessible to everyone who needs it. I'm a big fan of U.S. veterans, and they're having a really hard time getting credit and loans right now. So there is a lot to talk about and a lot to do. Elizabeth, really appreciate you taking the time and joining us on Bloomberg Business Week. Elizabeth Gore is president and CEO of the fintech platform for small business owners. Hello, Alex. Uh, hello, Alice. Excuse me. She joins us from San Francisco.